Becky was born on May 12th of 2006. When she was born, she instantly became the love of our lives. We lived for her. His presence was so important to both of us. His smile gave us both light every morning and every evening. He was a simple man. There was not a day that went by where we did not drive him to work as a family. Most days, he would even have us come for lunch at work instead of eating with his teammates inside the training facility. And every evening after practice or a game, he would look forward to spending more time together with us. We were bonded like glue, and our brightest part of life was raising our daughter. She was his pride and joy. To Sean, his daughter was his life. He bragged about the simplest things she did because he was so unbelievably proud of her. He would talk about what he wanted her to be in life, and because of Mr. Rivera, he is not here, and all of this has been shattered. The loss of Sean has caused so much pain in my heart, and one night while I was sleeping, my beautiful little family was over. That night in particular was one of the most magical nights we ever shared. Before bed, while bathing, with, while bathing our daughter, we talked about life and our future. We said that if this was what life was going to be like for us, then we would be so happy and satisfied. The love between us had never been stronger. Sean wanted his daughter to be so proud of him. He would store all of his memories in a box and wanted her to one day be able to see all he had done and accomplished. Now, looking back, I am so grateful for that box. A year after Sean passed, my daughter started school, and although she knew her daddy was in heaven and only had mommy around, school, school cemented the loss even greater. My daughter never got to give her daddy a hug after her ball ballet recitals, graduations, soccer matches, and holiday shows. All the other kids had daddy's arms to run into, but not Jackie. Every father daughter day at school, my daughter has had an empty seat next to her because daddy no longer existed. Why? Because of Mr. Rivera. And because of him, daddy has not been there on the sidelines to cheer her on at sports activities like he wished to. His dream in life was to retire just in time to coach her in tennis. He dreamed of her being the next big tennis star. At the beginning of each school year, Jackie has to present her lifetime her life timeline assignment. After the first 18 months, Daddy is no longer in pictures, and she has to explain to her classmates why. At six years of age, she has to stand in front of a classroom full of kids and tell them that her dad is in heaven. It's just not fair. It's not fair that he was only able to enjoy her first birthday party, and boy, did he enjoy it. He danced with her, played with her, and even gave her a pink car buggy that he pushed her with around the entire party. Every birthday party after that, and for the rest of her life, he will not be there. You only get one dad, and hers is gone, and no matter what, she can never have him back. It breaks my heart to pieces to go through each day and each milestone without him and be able to witness the beautiful and amazing girl she is growing into. I know how proud he was of her, and I can only imagine how he would feel now. I remember how much he loved taking her to work with him, and how on his days, on his off days, he used to love to have her sit and watch him work out. He would often take her to the office and show her off to his coaches and teammates. Sean's success provided financial security and stability to many of his loved ones, especially his mother and siblings. That stability is no longer there. He lived for his family members and would do anything for them. He was so proud and honored to call them his family. He found true happiness by seeing other people smile. He really did. He loved children and had so many ideas and dreams of setting up an organization to help them. Sean's death has not only broken our hearts and our family, but it has caused fear in both our lives. We don't sleep the same at night and suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. All in all, my daughter lost her daddy and there is nothing I can do to mend her heart. There's absolutely nothing that can bring him back. On that night, my daughter went to sleep with her daddy and woke up without one. The next affidavit is from Jackie's father, Rene Garcia, and both of them are present. 
I respectfully write you this short letter to express to you what we have all endured since the night of the incident. More importantly, what I have had to see my daughter and granddaughter Jackie go through. What I have had to see my daughter go through in the past six years is truly a father's worst nightmare. The suffering she has had to endure as a result of Sean's loss has been so profound. Not only did she lose her partner and husband, which in itself is so painful, but the fact that her daughter lost her father just makes it all so much worse. Seeing her daughter have to go through life's biggest milestones without her dad present just destroys her. I know my granddaughter is often thinking, why me? Why, why don't I get to have a daddy like everyone else? With those thoughts and questions coming up often, I know my daughter struggles with the fact that this will never change. For the rest of her life, her dad will not be there for a single thing, and there's nothing my daughter can do about it. To make matters worse, she will have to continue to go through the details of this incident until the legal process comes to an end. Your Honor, it's been extremely hard. All I can do is try to take Sean's role as much as I can, but I can't fill, out, fill those shoes entirely. I can just try to make it a little better. I ask that you use your best judgment to make sure that no family has to go through what we have gone through, especially Jackie and her daughter. And that was from Renee Garcia. Next, I'm going to read an affidavit from Donna Juner, who was Sean's mother, who I also believe is present. The death of my son, Sean, has been devastating for me. For the past six years, I have been an emotional wreck. I couldn't handle the pain and loss I felt. I was in shock. I can hardly remember the first few months after his death. It felt like a dream I couldn't wake up from. I didn't want to accept that my son was gone. Whenever I would think about him and how much I loved and missed him, the grief was unbearable. It was so bad that there were days I didn't sleep. I just couldn't understand how this happened. He didn't do anything wrong. He was a good man at home with his family. He didn't deserve this. Why would someone break into his house to rob and kill him? They took my son away too soon. This was all I could think about for months and months. Now I try to cope by focusing on the happy memories of him spending time with me and our family, or I think about his smile and how it lit up his face. I feel like I have lost a very special part of me. Thanksgiving and Christmas is a very hard time for me because it was Sean's favorite time of year. Sean was very generous and had a giving heart. As a child, he always promised me that he would one day take care of me and his sisters and brother. He did it. He kept his promise. But it breaks my heart that he will not be able to raise his daughter, baby Jackie, and be a part of the many milestones in her life. Sean was a family man. He loved to go fishing with his brothers and cousins. He was happy just staying home playing with his nephews and little cousins. He was also very protective over all the women in our family, especially his sisters, Monica and Sasha. He really loved when the whole family got together. But there was nothing like having Mama cook his favorite dinner. My entire family is still grieving over Sean's death. There are still times when I expect to hear his voice at the other end of the phone asking me to take care of something for him or see him come through the door unexpectedly with that huge smile on his face. But it doesn't happen and it never will. I have my good days, which means I make it through the day, I made it through the day without falling apart. And then there are the bad days when the tears and the pain are more than I can stand. I have my three other children that I love just as dearly. They give me the strength, courage, and purpose to carry on. Watching my children have to deal with their brother's death has almost been as hard as losing Sean. My heart will never completely heal knowing that I have to live the rest of my life without my son. I ask you to sentence Mr. Rivera to the maximum punishment that is permitted by law. And that was from Donna Juno, Sean's mother. And I believe Mr. Taylor would like to address the court. Good afternoon. 
this is a, this has to be one of the most difficult things that a father or a family could ever go through. As a young man, Sean had aspirations just like anybody else. The thing that Sean didn't do was quit, give up. He fought. He was a young child that was at 11 years old. Myself took the custody of Sean, and I raised him. My family, he was our, our leader, our little pilgrim that we look at. He was like a star that you want to look up and say, hey, I want to be like this kid. Never quitting, never saying no. I try the best, I do the best I can, I'll do whatever it takes to be the best, and I won't take shortcuts. This is not about football players or anything, this is about life. A young man that wanted to take the shortcuts, he took the shortcuts and took a, a man's life. He was in his house sleeping for no reason at all with his family. My mother lived to go to the weekends just to watch him play football and have something to do. When she retired, she has that not to do no more. I must say that in law enforcement, we often hear the thing about 1020 life. 1020 life, 1020 life. If you use a gun involved in a case, you get life. Y'all know you have to do the best thing you have to do, just like you told the juries. I'm charging with a duty to do, judge. I'm asking that they, this, the people have spoken. The team of Mr. Rubens, Penny, and Mr. Ray did a fantastic job. They came in and they presented everything. There was one picture that was in that, in, inside that they showed you. It was a stain of blood that was on the floor where Sean was fatally shot. Some that you or know anybody, you or anybody else will never know is that once he's pronounced dead, I returned to that house. And I truly believe in the blood of Jesus. I went to that house with my cousin, and I cleaned up every bit of blood of my son. Every bit of blood of my son. I heard the attorney talk about Shakespeare, and I heard him talk about other things. But what he failed to tell you is that Every time he opens his laptop, he looks at his child. Something I'll never be able to do again. I heard you say that you were going to pick up your grandchild. Well, guess what? Sean will never be able to do that again. This countless act of young men killing young men is horrendous. It needs to cease immediately. I know that God has a last say so about everything in life. But he did say in Romans 3, 13, 3 that if you do good, good will follow you. And if you do wrong, you surely should punish, be punished. I ask that you take this opportunity, Judge, and cease life. And let Mr. Revere know and let the other people in this world know that when you got good people, sons out there that's trying to do right, busting their butts, getting all they got, when you're home sleeping, he was, he was out working, doing his work, doing his craft, Improving his craft for everybody else to see. Sean didn't play football for the fun. He wanted to give the fans of what, what they look for. Enjoyment, laughter, happy. Because the world is a sad world. Judge, I thank you for your time. I thank you for your patience on this whole ordeal. And God bless you. And I hope that you do the right thing. First, by reading, there were four letters that we submitted um, by people who could not be here but wanted to make a statement on behalf of Mr. Rivera. The first is from Bishop H.G. Watkins, who is a pastor at the Jesus Christ Outreach Center in Fort Myers. And it states, Eric Rivera, Jr. attended Jesus Christ Outreach Center along with his family at a very early age. He was baptized and participated in the youth choir. We're deeply saddened for all the families involved and pray for God's mercy and yours. 
Next is a letter by Forrest Walker, who is an assistant principal, and he states, it is with great pleasure and an honor to have been asked by the Rivera family to share my sincere thoughts and experiences on the character of Eric Rivera, Jr. In retrospect, as Eric's math teacher, he was extremely smart and talented in his academics. I always knew him to be very respectful, outgoing, popular, and generous towards his peers and adults. In class, he was always able to comprehend and understand concepts quickly. He always assisted his peers when he completed his required coursework. I have never observed Eric displaying any type of violent or harsh behavior towards anyone. He always had a cool and collective demeanor, always well-dressed and well-groomed. Eric comes from a well-respected family within our community, and he truly obliged himself in sustaining his family's morals and values outside the home. When I received knowledge of this disheartening situation, I was deeply moved and surprised because this was far beyond the character of Eric Rivera, Jr. Again, I'm very appreciative of this opportunity in reflecting on my personal experiences and exposures I have witnessed towards Eric, and my heart and prayers go out to all those families impacted. Next is a letter by Alberto Cuerto, who is um, Eric's Spanish teacher. It is with great pleasure that I write to recommend Eric Rivera as a character reference as a student in my Spanish class. I've known Eric his sophomore year, and he has shown great interest in the success of his assignments. Eric was an excellent student. Eric took his schoolwork very seriously by displaying effort and interest in his work. Eric was a student who was committed to being a positive role model for other students. During his freshman year, he was the football team's quarterback who led them to a perfect season. Eric also displayed an excellent disciplinary record and an appropriate relationship with authority figures and his peers. I hope that you will look favorably on Eric's previous character during his high school experience. It is with honor that I recommend Eric Rivera based on his character as a student during his 2005-2006 school year. If I can provide any additional information in this regard, please do not hesitate to contact me. And finally, there's a letter from Ms. Trevia DuBose, who is Mr. Rivera's godmother. This is a character reference from my godson, Eric Rivera Jr who I've known since his birth in 1990. Eric has always been a sweet, loving, and mild-mannered person who treated everyone with the utmost respect, courtesy, and love. I live in Georgia, and I would travel to Florida at least once a year to visit Eric and his family. He would always greet me with a hug and a kiss. So to say the offense Eric is being charged with is out of his character would be an understatement. He is not only my godson, but a good person who deserves a chance at being a valuable asset to society. I humbly ask you to please give him an opportunity to set his life back on track and to consider the time that he has already served. Furthermore, Eric has an excellent support group of family and friends that can help him along the way. I know that he will not let us down moving forward. Thank you for taking the time to read this letter. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. And those are all of the letters that were submitted. And I believe his grandmother, Mrs. Churchwell, would like to address you first. Good afternoon, Judge, Your Honor. My name is Edwina Churchwell Howard, and I'm 61 years old. I'm a minister, and I want to talk about Eric's character. Um, when he was younger, he was always in church, 
and he never forgot my birthday or none of the holidays. He was a gentleman. He always carried my groceries in the house for me, and he's really a good kid. And I just ask you today to please have mercy on him. And please consider giving him a, the minimum sentence and give him another chance at life. Because I think he can be a good impact on the community and help other kids in our community to make better choices. And thank you for listening to my statement. And I want to give my condolences to all the Taylor family. And I'm praying for you all. And I will continue to pray for you. And please pray for me and my family. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. And Judge, next would be Ms. Um, Carmen Rivera, who is Eric's grandmother. My name is Carmen D. Rivera. I'm 67 years old, and I've lived here most of my life since uh, in Fort Myers, since I came from Puerto Rico. I had all my kids, and I was very happy to be there when Eric was born. And the minute I had him in my hands, he was to me, he was the most beautiful child in this world, of course. Being a grandmother, they say that's the way it is all the time, but to me it was very special birth at the time that it came and I was so happy to be there when his uh, when his parents weren't there and they were trying to work hard, very hard they lived with me for for several years until they could build their, a home for them to go and live and at that time I really got to to be close to him I'm um, we're both uh, families are, are from different religions, but he also would go with me to my church when he was uh, at my house. And he was always questioning me and also asking me what this meant and that meant because it happened to be mostly in Spanish. So um, from that time, I couldn't, he really never, I never seen him get upset, never be mean to anybody, never say a bad word to anybody. And and I just really couldn't believe that a child could be, do, be this way, you know, especially when the surrounding in the area where we live, which is so hard, peer pressure, and, and so many kids getting into trouble. But he never got into trouble while he lived over there, too. Never, never had any problems with him in school. Uh, he was always very happy and, and courteous, too. He never said a mean word to anybody. Not only the elders, but his peers too. And I cannot say one word that against him at all because I never, I never saw it. And when this happened, I was working and I was really shocked. I mean, I almost fell back when I heard this because it couldn't be, you know. It wasn't that he was only my grandchild, but I, it was out of his character like Dave already said. I says, I don't believe this, you know. He could never hurt anybody. Peer pressure is so hard, knowing from my times from here, the prejudice that ha I lived with, it was very hard. It was, I didn't have that much problem because my skin happens to be lighter, but I'm Spanish all the way. And we were treated very bad. On, as sometimes my mom would say, don't speak Spanish, you know, because you would be in trouble. I'll never have, forget. You know, that uh, the first time I got on the bus, when I came from, you, we don't, there's no segregation at that time. And to have come some a long ways, and for kids to, to really, to see him like this, treat ev everybody the same way, very nice. You know, I, I always told my kids this, because we live so hard, and now seeing that everything that happened, I saw the death of the best Martin Luther King, Kennedys, the Kennedys, and all the prejudice, and to have this child raised without that prejudice, it was is something to really, he was he didn't have this malice for the other people, none, none whatsoever. And, and I really, you know, being, I'm not the best Catholic, 
I've had my problems. You know, we all, we're not perfect by any means. He was a normal child. He got into little things were not bad at all, you know. And uh, he would not want to be cooking or something. He always wanted to see what I was doing and wanted to learn why you use this and why you use that. You know, I guess coming from two different uh, backgrounds really helped him a lot, I think, instead of making it worse. Uh, I just, I see a lot of bad things happen nowadays, and and I always keep my faith. I know that there was problems at one time, and I remember a judge telling me, I don't see how you can keep going this way with everything that has happened. And I always remember her, and I said, I always have my, my best friend in Jesus Christ, which is the best. And I said, I never had any problems. Never had to go to counseling or anything like that. As a matter of fact, I became a counselor myself. I did a lot of work, you know, working with children. My, most of my life was working with juveniles. And I saw how things happened. Good kids that were put in the juvenile detention. And they always used to write letters, you know, about how they were glad that there was one person, at least in the system, that went looking for them and treated them equal, not for what they had been charged. And they really, a lot of people I was told, you know, we had a, uh, sessions that we had for the kids and stuff like that. And it's amazing, we used to play a game, how people, when they see you, first impressions, they judge you. And when, once they get to know you, they really are shocked to find out that you're not that kind of a person, which they had I thought that you were that person, you know. And, and this is the way it is. People tend to judge people for what they have done or what they think they have done, and they don't know what goes in their lives. And I think these young people nowadays have so many problems also. And to, for him to have raised above that, it's to me, it's, it, it's, it's, I admire those kids like that. And in my church right now, we have a, they give a mass special for English speaking people. And, and I went recently to it and I found out that most of the ones that attend there are young people. And that really, you know, I think about them and I do feel very bad and I pray every night also for his family and what they're going through. But, you know, you talk about Jesus Christ. He taught us to have love and not be judgmental. Of course, what he's been charged for is some, something that is, is wrong, what he's been charged with. But I personally don't think he's that type of person at all. I don't know what could have happened or what happened at that time, but that's not the person that I know and what he's capable of doing. He, he uh, you know, like I say, he never has had anything wrong. And uh, he always, when I see him, he comes to me, he gives me a kiss and a hug. And, and first he asks me, how are you doing, Grandma? You know, he's always, and then his, his uh, bond with all of us is so great that, that I'm, I'm very blessed in that, in that respect. So I'm asking you to please, you know, don't judge him for what he's been charged, but also think about this, this young man that has his life in front of him, and he, he's going to do good for a lot of people. He's going to impact a lot of young people and help them because he knows what he went through. He's gone through, and he's going to go out there, and he's going to help these young people because he represents them. A lot of people, he represents them. Uh, the blacks, he represents the Spanish, our minorities, which really need somebody that can say, I was there, but you can't come above that. And I want you, Your Honor, to please give him this time for him to be able to help others in that respect. And like I say, uh, it's a tragedy and I feel bad and I, my night at night when I pray, I pray for both families because I would 
you know, to lose someone in your, in your family or whatever. It's very, it's very hard. But we've also go to, we've been in hell ourselves, the family. And knowing what he's going through, we feel it too. I mean, he does, he's still here, yes, and I'm glad for that. But I, I think he can do really good for the community and his family and for the young people that are coming up. Please give him that chance so he can help others. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. And Judge, next will be his father, Eric Rivera. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Eric Maracino. I'm the father of Eric Jr. Uh, first of all, I'm going to start off by saying my condolence goes out to the Taylor family. Um, it's going to be kind of tough for me to speak. I'm kind of emotional, but <clears throat> I want to start out by saying that, you know, growing up as a kid, you know, we make some not good, so good decisions. Sometimes we make good decisions. You know, we learn from our good decisions, and we also learn from our bad decisions. Now, growing up as a teenager, you know, my life, you know, my growing up, you know, it was kind of tough. I was raised by a single parent. I made some good decisions. I made some bad decisions. But from my bad decisions, I grew up to become the young man and the man that I am now from my bad decisions. You know, my bad decisions, you know, I knew I had to make a lot of changes in life. And I did, you know, and I became the man that I am now. By saying that is that, you know, nobody's perfect. You know, you made decisions in life that you know, you regret, and you can make positive things out of that. You know, I did that, you know, personally as a teenager. You know, my first thing is when I made my bad decisions, my first thing was when, you know, I have a chance out in the society that, you know, I'm going to make positive out of my bad decisions. Now, one of them was that, you know, I want to teach younger kids. You know, the kids that are growing up, young kids, teenagers, young men. You know that you know I've been there. You know I've I've you know I grew up. You know you know from you know one single parent. You know it was tough for me, but you can overcome it. You know and I want you know I'm a proven fact of it. So you know that's what I did. You know growing up when I got the opportunity, you know. That's what I do now. I've been doing it for the last 15 years is talking to kids, you know, because right now, you know, our society now, you know, for young kids, it's, it's, it's tough out there for them. You know, peer pressure's out there, you know, and, and all the other surroundings around them, you know. But what I want to say is, you know, I want my son to have the opportunity that I had, you know, and I think – he can overcome and be a very good asset to society. You know, um, you know, just going through the situation that he's going through now. You know, he has one thing that I had was a good support group was my family. They were always there for me, and you know, I really wanted to be there for them. So, I think Eric Jr. is in that same situation. He has a very good support. You know, with his family, we're here for him. We're always going to be here for him. You know, Eric always grew up, you know, as a kid that had fun, went to school, enjoyed playing sports, was a good kid. You know, never really got in trouble, never talked back, uh, never really seen him get mad, you know. And, you know, it's just a, this whole situation, sad situation for everybody involved, you know. Your Honor, I just ask that you consider that, you know, 
good decision, the bad decision could turn out to be, you could turn out to make the best of it. I think everybody would do that, and I wish you would consider being lenient on him on the sentence and give him the minimal sentence allowed by the courts. Thank you, Your Honor. Next will be his mother, Anisha Rodeo. Good afternoon, Judge Mother. I feel like I know you've been in a courtroom for over the last six years, on and off, for Eric. But the first thing I would like to say is, to the Taylor family, I'm sorry for your loss. I mean, words can't explain how you feel, but I also have been praying for your family as well as mine. <clears throat> I'm the mother of Eric, and it's kind of hard for me too. Oh. He's my only son. And at the age of 19 is when I had Eric, and I was a teenage mom. And at that age, I was still immature. And at the age that Eric, these consequences, he was 17. And I know that he wasn't mature at the time. But in these last six years, I've seen Eric grow from a little boy into a young man. Since the day he was born, he gave me great joy, sincere love, always loving our family unconditional. And I can still remember like yesterday when he used to walk in the house and he used to say, hi, mom. I love you and give me a kiss every single day. And I miss that. And I'm, I'm sorry. He's the brother of, I have two other girls. Um, one is 25 and she's in college. And she couldn't be here today because she had two tests. And I have another daughter who's in middle school in Eric's. 12 years older than her. And he's always been like a second dad to her. To this day, he still gives me advice on Elissa. Um, he's always been a good brother, dedicated, devoted, protective of his sisters, protective of his mom, protective of his family. Since Eric was about six years old, he was involved in Pop Warner football. He loves sports. He actually played football until the age of six, all the way up until 2007. I have here an article in September 2007. Here, I just want to share a couple lines of it. He was the quarterback at Florida Christian School. It says he played quarterback in Pop Warner He's a defense back, but he sacrifices himself for the team, Coach Wallace said. That offense was led by quarterback Air Rivera. And in high school, he played quarterback. And some in part one, he played quarterback too. And he also enjoyed basketball. He played a couple years at the YMCA. But I would like to say today, Your Honor, if you can please have mercy on Eric and give him the minimum sentence. He is a good kid. And I, in my heart, I know that he deserves another chance at life. And I think that he can make a difference in other younger kids' life. And Eric, I want to say to you today, I love you. I'll always be here for you, no matter what, unconditional. God is by our side, no matter what, in every situation. You stay strong, 
keep your faith and every beat in my heart it beats for you son I love you thank you judge Hey, Your Honor, I want to um, actually just speak to the family and say, I know my words may not mean much. Um, over the past six years, I learned that Mr. Taylor was a good man. And I'm not making excuses for my decisions or my actions. But I just wanted to say that I live with his death every day, and I'm going to have to live with the consequences, and I'm truly sorry for your loss. I'm sorry. And Judge, um, other than argument, I just have a memorandum that I prepared for sentencing, and I think that's it other than argument. I'm sorry, what that? Just the memorandum that you know yesterday. That's just the original. State. Judge, as you very well know, we're here today to talk about a tragedy. And the tragedy isn't really what will become of Eric Rivera. The tragedy is what happened to Sean Taylor the night that Eric Rivera and his friends killed him. We're here to talk about that tragedy, and we're here to talk about punishment. And the fact is that this man who sits before you is one of the several men who targeted the home of Sean Taylor to burglarize it. They traveled over two hours to our community to forcibly enter the home of a Dade County resident. They brought burglary tools from this defendant's house to pry off the door of Sean Taylor's house, and they brought a loaded gun. And they brought a loaded gun to either intimidate the people inside, to injure the people inside if necessary, to help them get away with whatever they were intending to steal, and or to help prevent them from getting caught. And an innocent man is dead, and that's what happens when people bring guns to a crime like this. This man is one of those men, and he's responsible for it, and he should pay for it. Sean Taylor and Jackie Gonzalez were asleep in their bed, minding their own business on a Sunday night on Thanksgiving weekend with their young daughter when this man and his friends forcibly entered their home, broke into their home at 1.30 in the morning armed with a gun, and then kicked in their master bedroom door. Sean Taylor, in the end, was not just a local football hero or a national football hero. He was a true hero. He risked and lost his life defending and protecting his family. When he went to that bedroom door to protect Jackie and his daughter, he risked his life. And either that man or one of his friends, all of whom came together, kicked the door in and they shot him and they killed him for no good reason. And while he lay there on the floor bleeding to death, and you've heard who had to clean that blood up, they ran for their lives all the way back to Fort Myers where they had come from to try to make sure that they wouldn't get caught. So while he bled to death, they were trying to save themselves. And he's one of those men who did that. 
And you don't have to imagine how Jackie Garcia felt when that happened because you heard her testimony and you saw the photographs from the crime scene and you know that she lost Sean and her daughter lost a father and Donna lost a son and Pete Taylor lost a son and everyone who's responsible for that should pay for it. This man is responsible for that. He was just about four months shy of 18 years of age. He was man enough to be out of town all night long on a Sunday night committing a crime in Dade County. And with all due respect to his family who have come before you today, he's not a good person. He's not a decent person. He's a convicted armed burglar, murderer, and he's an admitted perjurer. You know, he admitted during his testimony for his own benefit in front of the jury, he said, well, you know, Judge Murphy, when I told you that my sworn statement to the police was true, well, that really wasn't uh, the truth then when I testified <coughs> under oath to you. I just said that because I didn't think it was relevant. So let's continue to see how well he's evolved since committing this crime. He always has a contrived and convenient excuse for everything. The fact is that even after committing this terrible crime, during which he helped murder Sean Taylor, and after turning 18 years of age, he took steps to intimidate and possibly injure a state witness in order to subvert justice, Ariel Boston. You'll recall the letter that he wrote, and he admitted that he wrote. And I'm going to read just a few lines out of it. To his buddy, Jairus Bryce, who's his cousin, and by the way, one of the people who was arrested with him with a gun uh, in 2007. Play this smooth. Get Ariel to say the story I want her to say. Send Charles the story. Cuz, y'all just handle Ariel ASAP and I'll be straight cuz I already have an alibi. <coughs> Let her know if she don't go through with this, she'll be fucking on your people life and you're going to fuck hers. When she called them to change her statement to say she was just going with the rumors because she was scared. And then in talking about the jury whom he wanted to try to manipulate, in his own benefit, he said, all I need is one. So, I mean, this is the man who really sits before you. And what this letter proves, in addition to the crime that he committed that day, is that he's a sophisticated, manipulative criminal. And there's really no good reason to believe he's going to change. He didn't change, you know, from November of 2007 to May of 2008 when he wrote that letter. And he didn't change when he said whatever it was that he felt that he needed to see, say to get at least one person on the jury to become sympathetic for him. And with regard to the letter that he wrote threatening a state witness, he's the only person that we're aware of who did that. Furthermore, before settling on the most recent um, defense of false coerced confession, you know that he was going to create and fabricate an alibi. Now, of course, he's has some stupid fabricated excuse for this letter that he provided to the jury, like, all oh, shucks, I really didn't mean it, and everything else that he said and done, all of which, quite frankly, is collectively an insult to our intelligence. By the way, uh, I understand he's presently taking his act on the road. You know, he's a listed witness in another case where he wants to get on the witness stand and talk about his interaction with the judge. Mr. Rivera, first and foremost, didn't ask to become a witness. I don't even know if he's aware that he's been listed as a witness. That was done by another attorney. Um, he's not going to be able to become a witness. He's not going to be able to become a witness. He's not going to be able to become a witness. He's not going to be able to become a witness. He's not going to be able to become a witness. He's not going to be able to become a witness. He's not going to be able to become a Regarding Detective Segovia using the same improper techniques in another case, he used in this case. That's why they want it. But I said I would approach you about it and ask that he be barred from using it while this case was still open. Because I didn't want it to take it in the Texas case. I'm not saying Mr. Rivera saw it. I haven't even discussed it with him yet. This is news to him, so it's nonsense, Judge. Well, it's not nonsense. It's I mean, not that's the, excuse me, that was the, the Excuse me, that was the information that I was provided. Now, all the machinations behind that, I don't really know about, but let's get... Judge, if I may, uh, let's go past that for a moment. 
I don't think we need to have attorneys come in. There's plenty to talk about with regard to uh, Mr. Rivera that occurred before your very eyes and from your overall knowledge of the case. Besides that, you know, um, I, I heard the family say, and with all due respect to them, I mean, they seem to be decent people who've come in here and spoken with you today, that he's a good person, a good character. But you know from the motion to suppress and the pre-sentence investigation that the fact of the matter is that regardless of what kind of fa uh, family and upbringing and household Mr. Rivera Sr. tried to provide for him, he was out of control in 2007. And the fact of the matter is that he was arrested on August 13th of 2007 with a gun on a Sunday night in his father's car. The fact of the matter is he was arrested on October the 7th, but 12.30 in the morning on a Monday, which is another Sunday the night. bring in state attorneys for Fort Myers for Mr. Rubin once you consider this and ask them why they didn't charge him. They would look at the discovery from those cases. Well, they've talked about his character, and, you know, I don't even know if his family is completely aware of what his character is, but this is also embedded in the pre-sentence investigation, and so it's in that regard in response to the, and in response to their claims of good character that I mentioned some of this. So the fact of the matter is that he's been doing whatever it is that he wants to do out late at night for the entire year of 2007, and he didn't uh, become any better after he was arrested and charged in this case because we know for sure that he tried to um, subvert justice in this case by writing that letter to Jairus Bryce to try to do damage or injury either to the state's case or to Ariel Boston personally. And that's the man who sits before you uh, for sentencing today. Now, in the end, the most important information that I submit to you that we receive from the family and from the letters that you've heard is that he's a smart young man who thinks for himself. He's a leader, not a follower, but unfortunately, he has used those tools to become manipulative as opposed to using those things for some good benefit. And at this point in time, I submit to you that there's no good reason, there's no objective reason to believe that there's anything that's going to make him better in the future. Venja Hunt, who at least had the decency to admit his culpability in this terrible crime and agreed to cooperate, didn't threaten a witness in this case, and he's still scheduled to receive 29 years in prison. Judge, I submit to you that this man, Eric Rivera, should receive at least double that. I'm not going to ask you for a particular amount of years. I'm not going to specifically ask you to sentence him to life. What I am going to ask you is that whatever sentences that you give this defendant, that he should receive the same sentence for each of the two crimes for which he's been convicted, that if you and your discretion decide to sentence him to something less than life, that you put him on probation for the rest of his life. And finally, I'm asking the court to sentence him to at least 60 years in prison. Thank you, Ron. Judge, may I? Yes. Judge, as, as I stated in the memorandum that I prepared for the sentencing today, the case that has set the precedence for juveniles who are charged as adults and treated as adults in homicide cases is Miller versus the state of Alabama, which was recently decided by the United States Supreme Court. In Miller, the court gave several factors for the court to consider in deciding whether a juvenile convicted of homicide should be sentenced to life or should be given a lower sentence. And those factors include the circumstances of the homicide, the extent of the participation in the conduct, the familial or peer pressure that may have affected the juvenile, an inability to deal with prosecutors or police, and the possibility of rehabilitation. So first starting with the circumstances of the homicide. 
It was extremely clear throughout this entire process that from the outset, no one expected Mr. Taylor to be home. This was not a crime where it was murder based upon malice. It was murder based upon the unfortunate circumstances that occurred after the felony. So in going into the facts and circumstances of the case, it was very clear, and I believe it came even clearer during the trial, that Mr. Rivera didn't even want to be involved. And the facts show that he did call his sister before they left to go to Miami. Now he was- that, that, that was his testimony. That's not all what the jury found, obviously. But there was a phone call made to his sister that was shown by the phone records. And it was testified to by Mr. Rivera that he did call to try to get a ride home. But he did make a decision to stay with his friends, well, his friend, Mr. Wardlow, and the other young men, and to go in the car with them to Miami. There also should be considered the extent of participation in the conduct. The jury found, beyond a reasonable doubt, that Mr. Rivera was not the person in possession of the firearm. They had an opportunity to hear the evidence, view all the um, evidence, hear the testimony, and they decided beyond a doubt that Mr. Rivera did not have a firearm. And we would ask that you take Judge, their I ruling. that as well. What they decided is they decided that there was not proof beyond a reasonable doubt in their view that he was the shooter. That's what they decided. And Judge, you've seen the verdict form. They had the option of finding actual possession, discharge, as well as the shooting causing the death. And they chose not to find Mr. Rivera in possession of the firearm. The familiar or peer pressure that may have affected the juvenile. It was never Mr. Rivera's idea from the very beginning to go to Mr. Taylor's house. And if I could refer briefly to Mr. Hunt's deposition that was given in the case. Judge, I object to this. No, but it was brought up by Mr. Rubin. Excuse me? It was just brought up by Mr. Rubin in his argument about Mr. Hunt's action. Go ahead. Judge, I'd also point out that Mr. Hunt and everyone else for that matter said that Mr. Rivera is the person who shot Sean Taylor. Judge, it was stated that Mr. Hunt had just gotten out of jail. He wanted to do a robbery so he could get some money. Mr. Hunt told Mr. Wardlow, be on the lookout. If you hear of anything, let me know. And they all got together and made this plan to go to Mr. Taylor's house. It was never Mr. Rivera's idea. Mr. Rivera had never been to Mr. Taylor's house before. He wouldn't have known how to get there. He wasn't the person on the phone, on the trip over, getting turn-by-turn -turn directions on how to get there. If Mr. Rivera was involved at all, it was a very minor role. And that is a factor to be considered under the holding in Miller. The inability to deal with the prosecutors or police I won't touch upon. But what I will touch upon is the possibility of rehabilitation. Mr. Rivera was extremely young when this happened. He was 17 years old. And as his mother, Ms. Anisha Rivera, has stated, he has grown and matured since this happened. Now, Mr. Rubin, in his statements to Your Honor just now, made reference to a letter that Mr. Rivera wrote to Ariel Boston to Darius Bryce concerning Ariel Boston, that's correct. That happened back in 2008. Here we are in 2014. He's significantly older now, and he's had to grow up. Whether he wanted to or not, he has had to grow up, and he has. And he has matured. There was nothing on Mr. Rivera's prior history, nothing in his prior contact with his school, with his peers, absolutely nothing that would have predicted this incident 
and there's nothing to state that this is a pattern and that he is incapable of being rehabilitated. Now, I also gave Your Honor, as well as the state, a copy of a case from the second district, which is Arrington versus State, which is cited as 113 Southern 3rd, and it's a case decided, Southern 3rd, page 20, and it was decided in 2012. And the reason I gave Your Honor, as well as the state, a copy of the Arrington decision, even though it's not controlling or holding in the third district, which we're in, is that it speaks to proportionality. The court in Arrington was in a position similar to Your Honor in that Arrington was charged under felony murder as a juvenile. However, it was found by the jury that, and it was abundantly clear in the Arrington decision, that Mr. Arrington was not the person in possession of the firearm. There was reference in the facts in Arrington that he was the person who may have supplied the firearm that was ultimately used, but he was not in possession of it. And in the case, the court stated that it was abundantly clear that Mr. Arrington's life without parole sentence was permissible. However, the Constitution forbids life without parole for a juvenile who did not commit the homicide, and cited Graham. And in making the decision, the court stated that the proportionality of the sentence for a person who was a principal and was a participant in the action, but was not the person who ultimately caused the death, should be lower than the person who actually fired the trigger. side case such that life isn't the maximum sentence there. Correct. Life okay. is the maximum. Okay. Okay. Life is the potential maximum that your honor can impose. I'm not trying to say that you can't. What I'm arguing is based upon the factors considered by the Arrington court, they decided not to impose life, and that's what we're also asking your honor to do here today. Mr. Arrington was 15. Mr. Rivera was 17. The jury found that Mr. Rivera was not the person in actual possession of the firearm, and that was the case with Mr. Arrington. And Judge Mr. Rubin made reference to Mr. Hunt in stating that Mr. Hunt took responsibility for his actions. He accepted a plea. He was willing to serve 29 years for his cooperation. But Judge Mr. Hunt, if we speak about proportionality in sentencing, Mr. Hunt was older than Mr. Rivera. Mr. Hunt stated himself that he was a willing participant in this burglary that led to Mr. Taylor's death. Mr. Hunt boasted on certain occasions that it was his idea to get rid of the gun. It was his idea to throw the gun on the way back on the alligator alley so the gun wouldn't be found. And Ms. Ariel Boston, when she came in this very courtroom and testified, herself stated that when they arrived at her house, it was Benja Hunt who sat there, laughed, joked around, and ate pizza without a care in the world. Now, Mr. Rivera has shown remorse for his role in what occurred. He has apologized to the family. He took the stand. He explained his participation in the incident. And Mr. Rivera was only 17 years old at the time that this occurred. Now, Judge, I'm not going to stand here and ask Your Honor to go below guidelines because, frankly, I don't feel that we would be able to prove by preponderance that any of the mitigator factors to go below guidelines should apply. And I don't really know how you can quantify the loss of life to equate to a specific term of years as far as a sentence is concerned. However, Judge, the Florida legislature, in setting up the criminal punishment score sheet, has decided that there are a certain number of points to award for the offense. There's a certain number of points to award for the victim injury points, as well as a certain number of points for 
the um, burglary offense of which Mr. Rivera was also found guilty. And Judge, we are simply asking Your Honor to consider that while this case does not warrant going below the guidelines, there also were no aggravating factors that were presented to warrant going above the guidelines as well. Judge, you can sentence him to life. However, as Mr. Rivera sits here today, he has testified to his role in it, and the jury has found beyond a reasonable doubt that he was merely a principal in the actions. We're asking that you sentence him to the lowest permissible sentence under the guidelines and allow him to serve his time to make amends for the wrong that he has caused and to put this behind him and become a productive member of society again. Thank you, Judge. All right, the state did present to me a score sheet yesterday by email. Judge, no, we, re we reviewed it. We agree it's accurate. Okay. I have and the paper shows... version, Judge, if you want. Hmm? Oh, yeah. It, it shows 20, 22.8. Yeah, 273.75 months. Yeah. Yes. That's 22 something. Okay. 273.75. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Being a judge is the worst part of our job. I'm not here to make anybody happy. I'm not here to make anybody angry at me. I'm here to try and decide what an appropriate punishment is for the crimes before me. Mr. Rivera is convicted, found guilty by a jury of second degree murder under count one of the indictment and burglary with assault or battery under count two. The jury also specifically found that he did not possess a firearm in a condition of the oath offenses. So there is no minimum mandatory sentence that the court can impose under the 1020 life statute. We've heard from at least two families today whose lives have been turned upside down and forever will not be the same again because of these circumstances. I can't fix any of that. I feel sorry for the family members on both sides. I've got a jury that spoke with regard to what they believe that I have to take into consideration and give it great consideration, despite what I may know about the case for the last six years. On both counts of these both charges in this case, the second degree murder and the burglary and assault or battery, I'm going to sentence the defendant Eric Rivera to 57.5 months in state prison, concurrent in both, both charges with all credit for time served. I'm sorry, Judge, 55.7 Years. Did I say months? You said months. Wait, sorry. <laughs> Rewind. Eric, 57.5 years in state prison with all credit for time served. With that, we're adjourned. All rise. One more matter you want to bring up what? Yes. Uh, for purposes of appeal, I also need to... If you, if he doesn't have the wherewithal and the financial means to appoint the public defender for purposes of appeal in this yes. case. And we ask that you declare his general policy. All right. He may need to fill out an updated application for indigency.